Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Xavier Salomon. I'm the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator and would like to welcome you on this rainy, horrible day. Thank you for braving the weather. Um, to celebrate the opening, really, of the exhibition um, on the three manis from the Norton Simon Museum. This, as you may know, is the fourth installment of a series of exchanges the Frick Collection has had with the Norton Simon in Pasadena, um, where we've been sending works um, to the West Coast and they've been sending some of their works to us, um, which is particularly uh, exceptional considering the fact that usually the Norton Simon does not lend their works and they started making a series of exceptions, um, which seem to be more and more, fortunately for other museums as well. Uh, but we were the first um, that they started lending to on a regular basis. And so this is the last uh, of these four installments. We had a series of masterpieces from the Norton Simon in 2009, um, which was a selection of various works from the collection, which was then followed by a beautiful Van Gogh portrait um, of, uh, of, of a peasant from the south of France, and then the Cagnacci Repentant Magdalene a few years ago, and now these three wonderful Manets, which, as I'm sure we'll hear tonight, uh, don't really have much in common except from the fact that they were painted by Manet and they all are the Norton Simon, but they show very different and interesting aspects of the artist's career and art. And the exhibition is going to be here until January. I am very pleased and happy to introduce David Pullins, our speaker tonight, who was here at the Frick as assistant curator for two years and worked on this exhibition while here, but who has recently been very excitingly appointed associate curator in the Department of European Paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So he's back with us tonight to celebrate the opening of his show um, from across the street. Uh, Dr. Pollins received his MA from the Courtauld Institute of Art in London, and after that a PhD from Harvard University. He's um, been working on a number of different topics, mainly in the area of French uh, 18th and 19th century, and he's published widely in journals, art historical journals like the Burlington Magazine, the Journal of Art Historiography, Master Drawings, Oxford Art Journal, and Print Quarterly, and has contributed to a number of books and exhibition catalogues. Um, he's going to be talking to us tonight about Manet's lost years and introducing the show. So please join me in welcoming David Pollins. Thank you so much, uh, Xavier, for this warm introduction uh, at an institution and colleagues, both very close to my heart. And I'm thrilled to be here. Also, thank you to my colleagues who are showing the continuity of this. Uh, it's a kind of funny constellation of two parts of my brain at the moment. Um, obviously, I reiterate Xavier's thanks um, to everyone involved uh, at the Norton Simon, particularly Emily Talbot, Carol Tognieri, and Walter Temeshuk, also our funders, several of whom are here tonight, who made it possible to really realize both the exhibition and the catalog, a pretty luxurious uh, catalog, uh, under the best possible circumstances that support uh, was fantastic. Um, also, of course, deep thanks to the incredible team here at the Frick, uh, the support of our director, Ian Wardropper, chief curator, Xavier, editor-in-chief of that catalog, Michael and Mitchell, and curatorial assistant, Rebecca Leonard. Heartfelt thanks to each of you and everyone I haven't uh, had time to mention. So my talk this evening uh, aims to strike a balance between giving some kind of broader access to Manet um, and via the works that we have, uh, we're fortunate to have right next door here, those are on view, but also some more in-depth looking at two of those in particular. Those are Madame Manet and the Rag Picker, for which new material emerged uh, to a greater degree uh, than probably expected in the course of the research for this exhibition. Uh, and that was also uh, new material that emerged in part because all three paintings were conserved at the Getty in the process of this. And it was in dialogue with their conservation team that some of these uh, discoveries were possible. Um, meanwhile, Manet's uh, still life, the fish, uh, which is in many ways the most spectacular, just go and enjoy it, will be uh, making a peripheral appearance. So the title of my talk uh, is, of course, hyperbolic. Uh, it's difficult to imagine any sizable part of Manet as lost, or if so, surely it would be his early work when he was still heavily in the shadow of Thomas Couture. 
in works uh, such as this. The few such paintings that survive to record this early, essentially lost moment um, help to contextualize the peculiar rough texture of Manet's first statement of artistic independence, his famous absinthe drinker, seen here on the far right, which signaled a break with Thomas Couture in Manet's own telling, and it's a painting that will reappear at the end of the talk. By lost in the title of, of the talk, of course, I meant more written out. We come to artists usually to fulfill certain functions in art history, particularly when, like Manet, they're so thoroughly canonical. So for Manet, this is an artist, surely, for whom we looked in the 1860s for Déjeuner sur l'Herbe and Olympia, as well as the lush, plainer colors found in the Frick's own bullfight from 1864 and the Norton Simon still life also of 1864. Apart from the celebrated bar at the Folie Bergère, until very recently, we also typically didn't come to Manet for his later career, the pretty women and stunning floral still lives that have been so impressively recuperated by an exhibition that has just closed in Chicago and just opened at the Getty. The lost years of my title, 1875 to 77, it's pretty, uh, just about a two year period, are of this latter kind. The paintings and a good deal of the documentation exists, but they've been unevenly absorbed or processed in terms of the scholarship. As we will see, this is a function most likely of Manet, I think, in a transitional moment in his own stylistic development, perhaps even in transition to that beautiful late career. Here, Manet himself occasionally perhaps seems to get lost in his process, not always performing at his most confident. He's experimenting, and not all experiments will succeed. But more generously, works such as those you see on the screen can seem to fail us in part because they don't fulfill what we want from Manet. His earliest efforts or final paintings, they don't always read from across the gallery as blue chip Manet. And so I hope that some of the images you see this evening fill out uh, a fuller picture of a very famous artist. Here are a couple uh, more such works to give you a sense. I find it remarkable also, and these things obviously relate, how many of these paintings are now located in places that people don't normally go looking for Manet. So throughout the talk and the captions, you'll perhaps see places like Sao Paulo, Stockholm, Milan, and Tokyo. I arrived at this subject, as I said at the start a little bit, um, because in researching the Norton Simons, Madame Manet, and Ragpicker, it was this period that emerged as a blind spot repeatedly in understanding these paintings, their dates, uh, even their relationship to other work. And it struck me that this was a moment that needed further evaluation. So I'll begin by framing this period of 1875 to 77 broadly, describing the kind of intersections that I believe impacted Manet, which is also to link Manet from being singular, which he was all about, uh, to linking him to other people and, and works of art. In particular, we will focus on three such intersections, the first with Impressionism around 1874, then with Berthe Moiseau, with whom he was in close contact leading up to 1874, and finally, perhaps the least understood, and I'm completely fascinated with and, and, and would love to, to understand further, which is Manet's visits to the country house of the collector Ernest Hochede in the summers of 1875 and 6. You see the Hochede's son, Jacques, here on the left. So we'll begin then uh, with Manet's relationship to Impressionism, a topic that could obviously be its own talk and has been dealt with extensively by others more qualified than myself. This painting here, known as Hommage de Manet, in which he is surrounded by figures including Monet and Renoir, encapsulates that story, but also risks simplification. The key thing to know is a contradiction. Manet was friends with almost all the artists who would become known as the Impressionists. He associated with them in the Café Gerbois and Nouvelle Athene. From the early 1870s, moreover, critics, including Castagnieri, Durante, and most notably Malarmé, identified Manet as the head of the Impressionist school. However, Manet himself consistently refused to be identified artistically with this movement or to exhibit with them. For to be an Impressionist meant you had to exhibit uh, with them and therefore choose not to be uh, part of the official salon. In a letter to Ciso, uh, Degas famously attributed Manet's refusal to his vanity but more likely, perhaps, the explanation beyond, as we'll see, a certain incompatibility of his technique with a fully Impressionist one, and his own penchant for figure and still life rather than landscape, 
was Manet's stubborn, striking determination to be part of that official salon. And in some ways here, he modeled himself on Courbet. He chose to kind of go it alone and be his own figure, which is why he's actually quite difficult uh, to discuss in the history of art. He both starts it and, then, and, and, and also refuses uh, that, uh, that mantle. So this is not to say with this relationship to Impressionism that he did not engage with uh, what was happening with Impressionism. As Mallarmé noted in 1876, there is indeed no painter of consequence who during the last few years has not adopted or pondered over some of the theories advanced by the Impressionists, and most notably that of open air, plein air painting, which influences all artistic thought. Here are two works that show Manet painting en plein air in the early 1870s, even though categorically we should probably still think of him as a studio painter, which is a key difference. Even in these examples, we know that the figure on the left is in fact a conflation of several models painted over time, undermining this important painting's identification from early on, as early as the 1880s, as the initiation of plein air painting, if not Impressionism as a whole. Manet's closest proximity to the movement is surely his stay with Monet in Argenteuil in the summer of 1874, notably the key year for Impressionism, their first exhibition had been that spring. On July 3rd, Manet was invited to paint in the garden of Monet's rented villa, a villa that Manet had actually kind of set up for Monet. Renoir, uh, turned, Renoir, as you see here, turned up at the same moment, and he adopted the same subject in this case, but not to Manet's satisfaction, who allegedly said, Manet to Monet, what Renoir does is the worst, the malheureux. <laughs> he will never get anywhere, exclamation point. Manet's portrait of Monet, um, oops, let's see. Manet's portrait of Monet at work in his peculiar uh, bateau atelier, this boat uh, studio contraption, is maybe the most emblematic image of that moment together that summer. Again, alongside his wife, Monet in full plein air mode. And the impact of the environs and artistic company surely resulted in some of Manet's most impressionist paintings. This is, in many ways, a key work. Not only does it mimic Monet in a broad sense of composition and subject, but also, of course, at the level of technique. Subject, composition, and treatment of light effects along the Seine was, by 1874, a very well developed Impressionist language, and I think this kind of gives you within a relatively short time frame, 68 to 73, how rapidly, even between two artists, uh, that language uh, evolves. Here, Manet flirts with, but in fact, in many ways, never fully adopts the kind of flickering surface pattern, what might be understood as a layering of gauzes on the surface. Rather, he prefers something more planar, maybe even heavy. He looks uh, look, I think it's useful to look especially at the center of these paintings here, broad, stable brush stroke shape, Manet's boats, constructive dashes, I think it's somewhat tempting to think of Cezanne, shape Manet's water. Obviously, I've given him the contrast of a painter he did not uh, admire as much. And the light impressionist touch uh, versus Manet's broad, buttery stroke seem in the end always to prevent him from falling into the world of Monet or Sisley, let alone Renoir. Reliving the Impressionist water of Argenteuil in the following year in Venice with Tissot, Manet produced some of his, maybe this, his most Impressionist painting. This is partially on his own terms. I think you can note again those oversized dash-like brush strokes at the center. And partially, I will venture in a kind of confusion. Note the buildings in the background, a peculiar bleeding of strokes, one into the other hard to locate elsewhere in Manet. It's an experiment that lasts a very short time. The only other painting from this visit to Venice, uh, most painters go to uh, Venice and paint quite a bit, he comes back with two things. Um, they went through multiple revisions, this painting, including the scraping down and movement of the Salute Dome, which I think is actually visible here in this slide. And in this, he's trying to achieve the effects, the effortless effects of Impressionism, uh, but in a much more belabored kind of way. And these details, I think, from those two paintings summarize, for me at least, some of the messiness of Manet's intersection with Impressionism. Manet might well have been key in sparking or encouraging the Impressionists, but ultimately, even when he flirted with their technique, it never really melded with his own. As the critic Oisman wrote of Manet in the year of his death, quote, when all is said and done, Manet is today as outdistanced by most of the painters who could once, and quite rightly, have considered him their leader. In the context of the intimate subjects of family, friends, and artists in Argenteuil, in fact, Manet was formulating more formal paintings for submission not to the Impressionist exhibitions, but to the official salon. 
the painting seen here was accepted to the Salon of 1875. Revealingly, it was ridiculed in the press, but not for impressionist faults. Rather, the faults leveled at this painting on the whole uh, were the same kind of faults leveled at Manet since Olympia in the, 18, in the early 1860s. Quote, heads with a moribund gray aspect, flat like a wall. You've heard probably similar things about Olympia uh, and Dejeuner sur le. A detail with dash-like waves helps to see Manet holding firm to something that he developed as a solution or midway point between his work and Impressionism. So Berthe Morisot, our second intersection, this is between two particular artists, in many ways more so here, uh, an intersection that can actually be maybe understood as an intensification of a particular thread of Impressionism, namely one associated in mid-19th century minds with the feminine and amateurism. Amateur practices had, of course, been an accusation against the Impressionist technique from the start. Morisot gave that a gendered frame. Morisot is of particular interest to us, I think, for two reasons. Manet's closest proximity to her aligns here, 1868 to 74, in the immediate lead up to this period of instability in his own practice. And no matter how we categorize her technique, feminine, amateur, her take on the Impressionist brushstroke is extreme. In many ways, extreme and in many ways idiosyncratic, in many ways she completely disintegrates the form through loose, sometimes it's kind of drip-like handling, and, and you can see that particularly in the plants there on the upper right in this painting from 1872. Manet met Morisot in 1868 at the Louvre, probably through Fontaine de Tour, whose homage to Manet, the group portrait you saw earlier. She was already an established artist. The key period of their intense exchange were the years leading up to her marriage to Manet's brother, Eugene, in 1874, at which point their relationship uh, cools. <laughs> we don't, we, I, I've, I've avoided that entire literature. Um, you see here two of the 11, to uh, nonetheless allude to that literature, two of the 11 portraits that Manet painted of her during that short period. Leaving aside those perhaps romantic feelings for one another, the gender politics of Morisot and Manet has been key to interpretation. As Manet wrote to Fantin Latour shortly after first meeting Morisot and her sister, quote, the Mrs. Morisot are delightful. It's just a pity they don't happen to be men. George Moore, sorry, George Moore, um, uh, an Irish uh, art critic who coincidentally later owned uh, the Simons Madame Manet, recalled Manet's uh, pretty outrageous statement about Morisot, quote, my sister-in-law would have been nothing. She would not have existed without me. <laughs> For generations, art historians were a little more generous than this. From early days then, Morisot is often taken as a result and inaccurately uh, as a student of Manet. There can, however, be no question really about the domineering force he exerted in the relationship. You can hear that from the sharpness of his words, really. In Morisot's account, when her Salon submission of 1870, which you see here, was ready to be picked up and taken to the jury, Manet stopped by her studio unsolicited. Quote, he took the brushes and put a few accents here and there, and they looked very well. Once started, however, nothing could stop him. From the skirt, he went to the bust. From the bust to the head to the background, he cracked a thousand jokes and laughed like a madman. Finally, by five o'clock in the afternoon, he had made the best caricature you'd ever seen. You can see the difference, I think, in facture between the two heads in this work uh, today. Morisot's own term, caricature, I think pretty effectively captures the difference between Manet's relatively blunt brush, particularly this foreground figure, and Morisot's far lighter touch in the middle ground. Some writers have pointed uh, to this later portrait uh, of Morisot by Manet as having been impacted by the earlier work. Um, and there are other instances in which uh, there's the possibility of her uh, perhaps taking uh, the lead, as in these early paintings, or paintings of the early 1870s, something Charles Stuckey has noted of this period in particular. Though I think in this sense we have to be a little careful, um, also just because it's partaking really in a broader uh, Impressionist intersection that, that we've already uh, looked at. More concretely, it is widely acknowledged that at the end of this decade, Morisot's modern allegories, winter and summer, uh, depicted as fashionable women who sink into the surface pattern in this peculiar, uh, quite radical way, uh, was likely the inspiration for Manet's spring. On the whole, though, it's difficult not to find Manet leading in terms of subjects. The subject, though, 
subject of the paintings is really less uh, our concern about what's happening to Manet in the mid-1870s. For the aspect that I'm pursuing here, Manet's strange detours of facture, how he actually laid in his paints, um, in this capacity, more so accrues some more prominence. This distinction between what was painted and how uh, is an argument Carol Armstrong put forth for these two paintings. Not only does Manet's Before the Mirror inaugurate more feminine, quote unquote, feminine subjects of domestic scenes that will dominate his later career, but at the level of factor, it's wholly different than anything that had come before. And indeed, it is not only impressionist in handling, but can be seen as entirely disintegrative relative to Manet's classic flat, one might say stable brushstrokes. This is, uh, in some senses, the inverse uh, of the Morisot Salon submission. Here's my attempt to kind of visualize that uh, by combining um, them on the left. As Charles Efrussi wrote of Morisot in magnificently gendered terms, quote, she grinds flower petals onto her palette in order to spread them later on her canvas with witty, airy touches thrown down a little haphazardly, the amateur. Hoisman noted of Manet's Before the Mirror, uh, which we've been looking at from 1880, quote, it's a bouquet of lively patches in silver and blonde paintwork, which is interesting because these are not the kinds of terms previously used for Manet's palette up to that point. Morisot's facture, an idiosyncratic version of Impressionist paint handling, can be said to have been a bit of a detour for Manet. We could even further formulate this in sexist terms, if we want, as a kind of feminine distraction to his proper professional development. A little aside here is also he takes a bit of a detour through an exploration, some quite beautiful, of watercolor, something that she was up and running with uh, by this point uh, to a larger degree, which is achieves these kind of uh, transparent layers in a way that oil paint uh, does not as easily. Here's Manet's uh, reprisal, probably uh, the oil painting was first copied by him then in watercolor of Morisot. While specific connections might not lock down this bi-directional influence, the broader statement is one about the type of paint handling Morisot embodied in the early 1870s, a highly peculiar, loose, drippy facture, finicky in a way, for which the transparency of lace over window might be the ultimate metaphor. And I just, to conclude with her, um, show you her depiction of her new husband, uh, Manet's brother, with this uh, drippy treatment of lace, contrasting with Manet's treatment of lace as something that in many ways, if anything was gonna be dissolved, it might be this, and even here, uh, he insists on something uh, a little more opaque. So this brings us to the final episode before uh, addressing what this means for the two Norton Simon paintings. Um, this is his proximity around 1876-7 to seven to the Hochadet family. Ernest Hochadet was born in 1837, and he developed a family retail business that he inherited and further developed, which specialized, in fact, in lace, uh, and you see his ads uh, here. After inheriting a small fortune from his father in 1867, he amassed an incredibly impressive collection quite rapidly of avant-garde painting, beginning with works by Manet's hero in many capacities, Courbet. Um, however, Hochadet is probably best known today as being the first owner of this painting, Monet's Impression Sunrise, which of course gave the name through uh, critics uh, disparaging uh, words about it, uh, the name of the Impressionist movement. But Hochadet's family was evidently also interested in developing friendships with these artists. This manifested itself above all in hosting Manet, Sisley, and Monet at the family's country house, the Chateau de Rotenburg, which is located uh, near Montcarron, 16 kilometers from Paris. In 1877, Monet's visit resulted in a wonderful series of large-scale decorative paintings, um, evidently intended for the Chateau's uh, salon, and it depicted its grounds in various seasons. Monet's intimacy with the family went, as some of you might know, perhaps a little farther than anticipated. Uh, Ernest Hochadet's wife, Alice, would help take care of Monet's ailing wife uh, prior to her death in 1879. Thereafter, Alice Hochadet, who had her own fortune, separated from her husband and lived out her days at Giverny, uh, marrying Monet in 1892. The Hochadet Monet connection is therefore relatively well uh, understood and studied. By contrast, Manet's stay with them, we're not even sure if it was 75, 76, or uh, both, but I'm not going to bother you with that. Um, that stay is poorly understood. 
Writing to his only official student, another woman painter, Eva Gonzalez Manet, complained in a letter from this period that his stay at the Chateau de Rothenburg was a disaster. From a working point of view, there were too many distractions. While he had begun several large-scale paintings, including this one of his host with his daughter, he had trouble bringing anything to completion. This complaint is reiterated in a letter uh, from the critic Edmond de Ranty to Zola that relays news of Manet's stay there. Uh, Manet appears to have been simultaneously at work on several portraits of the Hochadé's neighbors, some of whom were Manet's friends. We'll look at those in a second. But the exact chronology of, of these two letters is, um, is not uh, precise, however we know within about a year. Just how much trouble Manet was having painting during his stay uh, at the Hochede country house, as described, attested to in those letters, is I think attested to strongly visually in works such as this and the number of incomplete works that resulted. In this instance, blocked out not with confident linear strokes, uh, you might even think of the Madame Manet in the other room that where you can see some of that, but rather a kind of persistent sketchiness. Marthe, the uh, daughter's eyes and nostrils in particular, they're, they're no more than dots, and it's a little bit of a, a kind of shock uh, to the senses of someone seeking Manet. It registers something of the impressionist experience uh, the, the pre in the previous year. Here, a comparable study for his portrait of Monet and his wife um, from that summer in Argenteuil, again, at a particularly large scale, which often seems to be part of the problem. It kind of expands beyond the, the scale of the sketch. Manet's similarly experimental portrait of Hochede's son, Jacques, was brought off to a higher degree of resolution, and Manet would show it as fleur, a tout decorative, a, a decorative study, at the Vimodern Gallery in 1880. He later submitted it unsuccessfully to the Salon des Arts Decoratifs, describing it as an overdoor panel, and often artists will do this, particularly in the 19th century, when they want to, to exhibit something or sell something that is a little unfinished to categorize it as decorative, and therefore the expectation uh, is lower. A pastel such as this one by Morisot seems relevant to the kind of peculiar tonalities, loose brushwork, and use of grass to collapse the space, or of course, again, more broadly, the impressionist context of Manet's visits to Argentois two years before. As Durante's letter noted, beyond the Rochede family, Manet's visit resulted in a whole group of oddly oversized, unfinished on the whole portraits that Gloria Groom has recently speculated may have constituted an unfinished decorative project, something like Mon Monet's uh, series for the chateau. Clearly decoration is, is, an over, is a reoccurring theme in these works. Manet's portrait of uh, Carlos Durand, who was a friend of the artist, but also lived near the Hochedes, and Eugene Perisset, who was um, sort of, a, in many ways, a comical figure for his lion hunting, uh, but he was also a neighbor of, uh, of the Hochedes, are seen here. Despite a, a reference to this portrait here on the left in a letter from 1877, it wasn't finished till the early 80s, and presumably it lived those kind of intermediary years looking something like the painting on the right. These two works are in many ways characteristic of the group, not only of the handling, um, but also the peculiar, at least to my eye, oversized compositional formats that seem to exceed the subject, as if Manet gives himself space and then he doesn't quite know what to do with that space. These false starts, evident in letters and paintings, can be linked to a group of little studied equestrian portraits that also exhibit evidence of Manet's impasse at this moment. This kind of equestrian portrait had been popularized uh, by Alfred de Dreux in the mid-19th century. Manet would have probably been responding to these two works uh, by Renoir and his friend, Carlos Durand, whose uh, portrait you just saw a second ago. Um, it seems logical that he was thinking about these, they're big scale paintings, when he does a group, none of which ever is resolved. Um, this peculiar decision to do an equestrian portrait in a horizontal uh, format, but then crop and crop the horse or turn the horse's head to fit. Um, and then these two works, the one on the right, deceptively, it's a, it's a really actually quite beautiful watercolor, uh, actually up right now at the Brooklyn Museum, um, where he's trying to work out uh, how to go about this and then never uh, resolves any of these paintings. Uh, in light of this, I think that this might actually be the Hoshide's daughter on the right, but that's kind of an aside. So in the remaining time, aware that I've taken up Half, over half the time uh, to situate the rag picker and Madame Manet. Um, I want to show some of the potential for thinking through some works that are a little less familiar here, this kind of painting, and that get a lot less uh, attention, in part for the obvious reason of establishing a more complete, complex vision of this artist, but also for the fact that stellar works could indeed 
come out of his studio during this moment. And we need only, of course, look at Madame Manet uh, here as evidence of the latter point. This particularly the case, now newly cleaned, uh, this work is particularly uh, as it's regained its brilliance. The range of dates assigned to this painting, Madame Manet, has ranged widely from 1867 in earlier literature to most recently 1874 to 6 in a catalog by Rick Brattel and Stephen Eisenman, who disentangled it from a long-standing misidentification with a bunch of other works. As they observe, even unfinished, this paint handling is consistent with Manet in the 1870s, not the 1860s. You can compare here, for example, its lively thin lines to the broad, calm brushstrokes of Madame Manet at the piano from around 1867. The portrait with which the Simons has the most in common is an undated and unfinished portrait in somewhat compromised condition at the Met. I'm unfortunately showing not one of our, our strongest paintings, but it is the closest uh, related to the Simon picture. Both works give the sense of having been executed quickly, but are actually built up from complex layers of stains and glazes that would have taken some time to achieve. This delicate treatment is particularly apparent in the clothing where single brush strokes of thicker oil paint delineate forms summarily, but are covered by thin down transparent grays and whites. The result, especially after conservation, is a meticulously worked up uh, surface of remarkable luminosity and depth, despite the canvas itself actually showing through. So in many ways, it should look perfectly flat. Madame Manet wears almost identical clothing in these portraits, a gray dress with pleated collar and a large bow outlined in black. In the Norton Simon portrait, a gold pendant on a black ribbon hangs from her underneath her blouse. The distinctive hat in the Metropolitan portrait topped by these two spiky pom-poms was also present in the Norton Simon painting before Manet painted that out. Though that hat is very apparent in X radiograph, you can actually see it for yourself, I think probably here, certainly in the gallery, as this kind of uh, halo that, that you can see around her head. In both hats, the, er, sorry, in both uh, cases, the hat proved particularly troublesome. Actually, this is the case in many instances for Manet. In the Metropolitan version, it once covered much of Madame Manet's hair and the extensive reworking of this area, including scraping down uh, dried paint, paint that had already dried, he scrapes off, has left a complicated form around her head. While Manet seems to have fussed with the face of the Norton Simon version until it became much denser and heavier than the surrounding surface, in the Metropolitan version, he repeatedly scraped it down uh, until he eventually caused the canvas to burr up into the paint layer, making it difficult to recover a, a kind of even surface. Madame Manet's appearance in two closely related unfinished versions is typical, actually, a typical result of, in this moment, his tortured relationship to Impressionist colleagues' uh, effects of spontaneity. His friend, Antonin Proust, uh, recorded Manet saying, there's just one real thing to get down what one has at first shot. If it's there, it's there. When it's not there, one starts over. Everything else is nonsense. But just how labored Manet's efforts were at appearing effortless has only recently been appreciated or perhaps admitted by art historians. I invite you to return uh, on November 20th for a talk by Emily Beeney, uh, who will be speaking about these issues for Manet directly. The result of this process was maddening for sitters. Georges Clemenceau claimed to have sat 40 times for his two, in the end, still unfinished portraits. Clemenceau agreed with Monet and Leon Gambetta that he would never again sit for Manet. Isabelle Le Moynier modeled for at least six portraits in the late 1870s, and her grandson recalled, quote, the sittings to which my grandmother submitted in order to please Manet, then quite ill, were completely exhausting. Manet doesn't know how to draw, she would tell us. He was endlessly starting my portraits over and over again. He destroyed I, not, I, I know not how many studies, etude, in front of me. Ultimately, she and other sitters, too, supplied Manet with photographs to work from. The portrait seen here, dated 1879 to 82, echo in many ways the Metropolitan and Simon pair. The pose, expression, distribution of light and tone in the two of these paintings are nearly identical. He's trying to work through similar issues. Manet confidently outlines the clothing, but struggles with the faces and how to terminate the head, be it with a hat, hair, combination of these two. In the Dallas portrait, this results in heavy cross-hatching built up over the face that reads as certainly less spontaneous than the rest of the canvas. In the Copenhagen portrait, Manet so aggressively scraped down the face that the canvas has again raised, uh, the fibers have raised up into the paint layer, resulting in this hazy, muddled kind of effect. 
this has been probably exacerbated by later attempts to recover it. Suzanne Manet's distinctive gray dress, white blouse, black hat, Link the Norton Simon, and Metropolitan Portraits with a previously, and in retrospect to me, very surprisingly uh, unassociated work. This was a fun uh, thing to see, I thought, um, which is this painting, Madame Manet at the, in the Conservatory. X-radiography and surface disruptions indicate that here too, Manet actually attempted to place the hat on her head, but he ultimately left it there on the bench. It's hard to see, but the pom-poms are the identifying feature of its kind of deflated uh, form. The figure follows the Metropolitan version's three-quarters pose as if she were awaiting a companion. Recent cleaning and x-radiography of the Norton Simon painting have brought out these three parallel lines you see kind of coming out from her shoulder that further link uh, this painting to the garden bench in Madame Manet in the conservatory. This painting, Madame Manet in the Conservatory, has traditionally been considered a later offshoot of In the Conservatory. Manet's better documented portrait of Monsieur and Madame Guimet that was exhibited as a genre subject at the Salon of 1879. Thanks to new discoveries about Manet's studios and uh, neighbors, in fact, Juliette Wilson Barreau has proposed that In the Conservatory was, in fact, in progress since probably 1877. She argues for acceptance of the date of 1876 that it actually appears on the painting itself but had long been dismissed by the desire to push it to the Salon of 1879. This reverses their chronology in many ways. Manet worked through light, color, compositional arrangement with his wife's portrait before engaging uh, the Guimets for their painting. This seems perfectly logical, of course, in, in retrospect, the model was at home, easy to pin down, and a good opportunity to work through, as he probably knew, things he was not actually good at necessarily doing in one go. Beyond the broader composition, even the open work grid of the Shaw at right in the earlier work rehearses Madame Guimet's more restrained, he painted it for the salon, but still diaphanous dress in which the bare canvas likewise shows through. A critic uh, described it when it was shown at the salon as a gown that seems to be made with great strokes at a gallop. An unfinished half-length uh, Madame Jules Guimet uh, on the art market may have served as an additional middle step here. Like Manet's portrait of his wife, uh, Le Monnier and others, he scraped down and re reworked the surface uh, repeatedly of the face, so it's difficult to get an exact sense of her expression or even the direction of her gaze. However, the richly painted auburn hair, quickly worked dress, and especially that green bench, bench with its emerald green is identical to those found in Madame Manet in the conservatory. Wilson Barrow, uh, who's major, uh, the major scholar on Manet, proposes that Manet might have encountered this indoor bench uh, in these two paintings when visiting the Hochede country house. Alas, 19th century documents about the chateau and the house today give us no evidence that such a space ever existed. Rather, a description of Manet's Paris studio from April 1876, on the other hand, describes among studio props a garden bench painted green, and faience faces. I should say that's something that came out of research for the Getty show. I shouldn't claim that discovery. Both of which, these studio props, the vases, the bench, suggest that in fact these were probably painted uh, in Paris. But links between Manet's Hochede portraits and Madame Manet remain, I think, important. Manet's radically summary and unfinished portraits of his patron with his daughter was also an attempt to solve the problem of organizing male and female figures horizontally around a garden bench. Conflated descriptions of several paintings in process made by a visitor to Manet's Paris studio in 1877 suggest, in fact, that he was thinking through all three paintings at the same time. That visitor describes a couple linked by a bench, as in the Guimet painting, but then a plunging forest background, as in the Hochede unfinished portrait. This whole constellation of works not previously studied together should probably be considered part of the genesis of In the Conservatory and date, I would argue, uh, in the catalog at least, in 1876, leading up to the Salon painting. That so many works fed into this major submission to the Salon is not surprising. Manet's statement, as relayed by Proust of his interest in, in quote, creating two figures who generate attraction in their duality to personality, the duality of personalities, is useful for understanding them. Since in the conservatory was first exhibited, the apparent dynamic between the Guimets has generated speculation about this couple. 
The garden bench divides as much as it links, particularly given Madame Guimet's, Guimet's uh, rigid pose and her blank stare. Critics found this kind of psychological disconnection one of Manet's most perplexing tendencies. With the Norton Simon painting as one point of origin for in the conservatory, it's useful to link and therefore kind of integrate that Norton Simon painting into a series of far more celebrated multi-figure canvases. The kind of spatial relationships that we see in this painting seem to become a leitmotif for Manet and his thinking and an important step. This is an important step along the way to works such as this, um, which shows figures around this horizontal table, or even more radically here on the right in the railway, or in the painting, The Railway, where the offense effectively takes the role of those uh, spokes in the, in the garden bench to divide the work. Of course, most spectacularly, this happens at the end of his career with the bar of the Folie Bergère. This hopefully, of course, not to overstate the Norton Simon painting's importance. Manet didn't know this when he was painting it, but rather to fit it into a constellation of works feeding into a larger practice that tells Manet's larger story uh, or development. So then we arrive here at the Rag Picker, a painting that from the start clearly was a much more ambitious work uh, and uh, is, the, is the kind of presiding presence in the Oval Room uh, next door. This is the capstone of a series of celebrated portraits of the artist grouped under the title Four Philosophers when he proposed them for sale to the art dealers de Rouen in 1871, at the end of 1871. Here's the series. Uh, it took shape, as you can see here, over many years, over a decade, and was cobbled together by Manet's failed first salon submission of 1859, The Absinthe Drinker, which you see here on the left, and its closely related descendants, the two paintings in the middle, both of which are now in Chicago. The hunt for sources rooted in the Spanish master Velasquez, but also partaking in popular print culture of urban types has dominated these paintings interpretation, quite rightly, and as has their complicated chronology carefully studied by art historians and conservators. It's this post sale, post, uh, post his sale of these paintings to Duran Ruel again in the mid-1870s, his revisiting of the rag picker that I would like to suggest uh, this evening as a contribution to the story of these uh, kind of uh, iconic paintings of, of Manet. Degas recounted that around 1858, Manet began this painting, The Absinthe Drinker, as a portrait of a Monsieur Coldray, who had caught the artist's eye in the Louvre. Having asked Coldray to pose, Manet learned that he was more or less a rag picker, quote unquote, who lived with his mother and made a meager living selling scrap metal gathered from refuse on the street. What Degas seems to misidentify, Coldray's profession, is partially resolved by the complex technical history of a painting that Manet altered multiple times. How it appeared when rejected by the Salon of 1859 is documented by a watercolor and early state etching that are missing the key attribute of the phosphorescent absinthe glass. When Manet exhibited in his one-man pavilion outside the Exposition Universelle in 1867, a caricature by Rondon, seen at the far right, cropped the figure just below the knees with a caption that suggested Manet should offer his sitter a glass that would fit the title of the painting. Technical analysis suggests that Manet actually did fold the canvas when it was shown in 1867 in this way, so that actually is part one iteration. We think about the formats uh, that we saw this kind of awkwardly large formats. Manet never uh, quite satisfied with the, the framing, hiding the surplus behind, only to then have it unrolled later on by 1872. Sometime between 1867 and 72, Manet followed Randon's prompt, the caricature's prompt, by adding, indeed, this absinthe glass seen here. Peculiarly, I think it's peculiar, but Consistent with what we will see with the rag picker, Manet's later edition is painted in a style that makes no allowance or concession for the moment the first work was executed. The glass's buttery factor stands out from the rough surface uh, around it and offers a summary in many ways of the changes in technique between the rough surfaces of Thomas Couture, which we saw at the very beginning, and Manet's smooth finish by the late 1860s, notably after a pivotal trip to Spain in 1865. Prior to that trip to Spain, Manet's knowledge of Velasquez was largely about motifs through prints, and it was likely based on prints that he produced the absinthe drinker, which compositionally and thematically relates to golden age Spanish painting, but not at the level really of its technique. 
when in 1865 he did encounter Minipus and its pendant Aesop in the flesh at the Prado, he wrote with enthusiasm to his friends, including Baudelaire, at last I know Velasquez and I declare, I declare to you that he is the greatest painter that there has ever been. All, all, all his works are masterpieces. He is even greater than his reputation. A letter to Fantin Latour employed much the same language and cited these two paintings in particular as the philosopher's both amazing pieces. Manet's pendants in Chicago were executed shortly after his return to Paris and shown with the absinthe drinker in his one-man pavilion at the Exposition Universelle in 1867. They continue the absinthe drinker's basic format and themes, but reveal his latest technique. He blocks rather than gradates his color and adopts the distinctive undefined color field background of Velazquez. Particularly, he cites this painting as the most extraordinary that he's ever done, that Velazquez has ever done, the background of this painting disappears. There is nothing but air around this fellow. And here, just a juxtaposition to give you a sense. Um, some of what may appear, it's a slightly conditioned thing, but on the left, it may appear as pixel, pix, uh, pixelization of the image is in fact in the flesh, uh, an incredibly rough, uh, un, uh, uh, not very saturated kind of surface. By 1867, Manet's desire to meld the philosopher beggar type, familiar from golden age Spanish painting, with contemporary urban life in Second Empire Paris was connected to an awareness of Haussmann's impact on the capital, its urban fabric, namely the destruction of huge sections of the city in order to accommodate the boulevards that we know and love today, a process that also resulted in the displacement of much of the urban poor. In that year, a friend of Manet specifically lamented the disappearance of the bigger philosopher type, which accrues pulled from the 17th century Spanish context to the 19th century. He is picked up by Manet's circle. Quote, the straight line of new boulevards and apartment buildings killed the picturesque, the unforeseen. No more colorful rags, no more extravagant songs or extraordinary speeches. The outdoor dentists, the strolling musicians, the philosopher rag pickers have moved elsewhere. Manet's original model for the absinthe drinker, who had self-identified as a rag picker, was, his social, was the quintessential uh, type for the social underbelly. So it's fitting, of course, that he concludes uh, the series with this, the penultimate figure. Not our topic, it's a vast one on its own, you, would, you might be shocked. Um, this is an important kind of social role that this sort of rag picker figure uh, served essentially recycling discarded textiles, but in fact, all kinds of things, metal and other things, from upper middle class households down the social ladder. In the hands of Manet and his circle, particularly Baudelaire, this emblematic figure was quickly romanticized. While overall Manet's rag picker is thematically consistent with the series, it stands apart in several characteristics. It's significantly larger than the other three paintings, and stylistically, it marks a third stage in Manet's technical development. The stylistic difference is probably the result of extensive reworking over years. Of course, we could, we could also have probably known this um, as a group that it took over a decade to create, so his style would, of course, change. And in this, though, I think that this is a useful image for thinking about what I'm proposing for the, for the um, rag picker, which is kind of a bleeding into and out of the, the paintings in the middle. So on the left, you have um, a painting from 1858 to nine, couture, rough surface, and in the 1860s, inserts is very smooth with making no compromise about his style of how he paints the smooth absinthe glass. The two in the center are single campaigns, essentially. He paints it, it's essentially done. There are changes underneath, but he doesn't return years later. Then the painting on the right, I'll be proposing he paints, and then again comes back, and much like the absinthe glass, makes uh, no compromise uh, for his, de his development in the inter uh, inter interceding years. Traditionally, the date of this rag picker has been dated between 1867, when Manet showed the first three paintings there, um, but notably not the rag picker, at a one -man pavilion, his one-man pavilion at the Exposition Universelle. And then 1872, he sold all four to durand ruel Presumably then, at that point, when he sold the rag picker, it was painted much in the style of those paintings at the center. And I think you can see something of that by this comparison of the beautiful still lifes in the foreground, uh, that from Chicago and the other, the painting that we have next door. This is exactly what you would expect from late 1860s uh, Manet. What stands out as odd, however, especially if we retain 
this detail of that buttery uh, manet of the 1860s at the bottom, are the rag picker's hands and parts of the face, characterized by parallel strokes from a comparatively stiff brush built up like hatchwork into an opaque, comparatively dull surface. As some authors have indicated, this seems to look forward to Manet's technique in the mid-1870s in paintings such as this, this painting known as The Artist. Um, here, this very specific technique is, is, uh, is apparent here. It's something he doesn't do for very long. Based on technical analysis done at the Getty, um, looking at these sections, particularly the hands and face, it's clear that additional paint layers were indeed added, and this melds with the stylistic uh, que question that suggests that rather than anticipate something, rather he actually uh, revisited this painting. Of course, again, as we've seen, this would not be uh, inconsistent with what he'd done before. And this brings us back to Ernest Hochede, because it seems fairly certain that Hochede would have seen the first three paintings in 1867, when, like Manet, he set up his private self-promotional pavilion, proffering his wares, his laces, at the Exposition Universelle, his neo-Renaissance pavilion. You can decide whether that's how, that's how the press described it, uh, was given quite a lot of attention. What we can be sure of, however, is that after the dealers de Rang Ruel had purchased all four, they sold just the rag picker to Hochede. It remained in his collection until 1877, a year in which Oshide declared bankruptcy and his collection was soon sold. Of course, this allows just the perfect window for Manet to have reworked the painting while visiting the Hoshides those summers of 1875 to six, a moment of major reevaluation on Manet's own part of how he built up his forms in a range of different and often experimental methods. Indeed, though this is obviously an unfinished work here, Something of the rag picker's dry, straw-like effect executed with a st stiff brush is also apparent. But if we're proposing reworking in this context, the Parisian makes an even more apt stylistic point, I think. This ambitious painting was, in fact, a failed salon submission from the summer of 1876, and as a result, presumably, was very much on the artist's mind as he worked through new te techniques, trying out those techniques on the public and, indeed, even the salon jury who clearly didn't sympathize with his developments. And I think this comparison is particularly helpful too because to think again about what he didn't change in the painting on the left, the smooth background, et cetera. On the right, if you're painting in this way where you feel the need to this animated, active, uh, kind of bristly kind of surface all over, perhaps the temptation to revisit the rag picker when he was visiting um, his patron and collector, Hershede, uh, in the country was uh, too tempting not to take up. So we, we release you. Um, with this deep dive into a pretty small but little address period uh, in the middle of Manet's life, I hope we emerge with a slightly different vision of him, a master somewhat more vulnerable and hesitant, experimental, uh, someone who could get lost and then perhaps find themselves in ways that his posthumous reputation as a catapult in the history of art has rarely allowed. Of course, testimony to his incredible power as an artist is everywhere apparent. Despite this, as you can see through the paintings on view uh, next door, be it technically, again, a plug for the still life, which is everything that you, that you could want from Manet, its surface rippling with energy, or the Halseyan kind of brushwork of Madame Manet, or the painting in the center, the daring choice of subject, the rag picker, wandering here into the Beaux-Arts mansion of Henry Clay Frick, in a way that recaptures, I think, so much of the scandal and excitement that originally surrounded Manet. Thank you. <laughs>